If you watch and subscribe to this channel, then you are going to love Curiosity Stream. Be sure to watch to the end of this video for a special offer. Well, right now, the sun is starting to uh, peak up over the horizon. And I am walking the, the dog green sector of Omaha Beach. I've read several books on D-Day and watched several documentaries and read about the, the men who, of the, the 29th Infantry Division and of the 2nd Ranger Battalion who, who stormed these beaches on D-Day. And one of the things that I'm always thinking and trying to visualize whenever I read these books or watch these documentaries is what did this look like from the German perspective? How, how did it feel for the, the German infantry soldier who was up here on the bluffs just to the right of me to, to look out across that horizon and just see this vast armada that had assembled to create the largest invasion in the history of mankind. How did that feel to them? It must have been horrifying. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is spend a little bit of time looking at the assault on the dog green sector from the German perspective. All right, now I know that I said that this was going to be a video from the German perspective, but you'll have to indulge me for just a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm in the, the dog green sector, and right here along this stretch of the beach is where companies A and B of the 2nd Ranger Battalion and elements of the 29th Infantry Division would have come ashore, and they would have come under withering fire from the trenches up here on top of this bluff. Now this house was actually here at the time. It was owned by a wealthy businessman. I'm not going to go up there because obviously there's a fence here uh, and I, I don't want to, to trespass uh, or go onto a property without permission. But there was also a 75 millimeter gun up there. There was a bunker that, that was in the process of being built, wasn't complete. But uh, the, the gunfire that, that was coming from that bluff line right up there would have just been murderous. I think in the first wave we're looking at around 50% casualties on the beach here uh, and the, the two companies of rangers after D-Day uh, ended up going into reserve because I think about two-thirds of them ended up being casualties. Just, just absolutely horrific. Now, we have moved west along Omaha Beach to the D1 exit at Vereville. And uh, a lot of people have the misconception that all along Omaha Beach, it's just saving Private Ryan from one end to the other. And, and that's simply not true. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were some parts of the beach where men just walked ashore. There wasn't this wall of fire uh, whenever you get in between these main resistance points. Where, where the resistance was really going to be the heaviest was where you had these exits off of the beach. So as you can see right here along this bluff, well, tanks and vehicles can't go through that. Okay, You have to go through these draws, and the Germans knew that. So the D1 exit was being protected by bunkers like this one right here at Wiederstand Nest 72. Now this one in particular would have been equipped with an 88 millimeter gun which was a, a fearsome weapon and as you can see 
Uh, well, these bunkers aren't designed to engage naval vessels. So if you look here at this one, uh, we can see this, this wing sticking out right here. That's designed to protect the gun from naval fire. Uh, this bunker here is designed to provide flanking fire down the beach, and the gun from this bunker was well positioned to do a whole lot of damage. Now, we can't go inside of this bunker, but the sun is shining in just such a way that we can actually take a look inside and see this 88. And yeah, that thing was a fearsome weapon. And this particular bunker, if you come and visit Omaha Beach, now serves as the National Guard Memorial. Uh, many people don't realize that the 29th, the 29th Infantry Division was a National Guard unit. I've just briefly moved up the D1 draw a little bit and uh, I'm obviously looking down at the ocean right now and uh, there was another Wiedersten nest that was designed to protect this draw. So the Americans obviously would have been looking for an exit up in this direction and guarding this area was Wiedersten nest 71. Now, you can't hardly see anything right now because it's all covered in vegetation, but it's almost uh, a little bit more than a, a 90 degree bend in that concrete bunker. Uh, would have been two windows. One, this one right here, would have had a window pointing directly at me, covering the exit. And then the other one would have been covering this direction right here. There are also some uh, mortar to brooks that are up there at WN71 as well. Now, Wiederstand Nest 72 would have been manned by Grenadier Regiment 726. And the, the bunker that I just left isn't the only thing that was right here. Again, the Germans are trying to protect this draw, so this was a heavily concentrated area of defense. Uh, inland, there were a couple of uh, mortar positions. Uh, there, there were machine gun nests and trenches. And there was also this bunker right here, just below the bunker we were at. So here is the lower bunker here at Wiederstand Nest 72. And if we come around the side here, we can see the, the front opening where the gun would have fired from. I'm pretty sure that this one housed a 50 millimeter gun. Uh, and uh, obviously it's less powerful than the 88, but this one and the other bunker that we just showed would have been working in concert with one another to defend this sector of the beach and provide flanking fire uh, to protect the D1 draw. And as you can see, uh, there is copious amounts of damage to this bunker. Uh, these were I mean, they're right on the beach, and, and they stick out like a sore thumb. So these were prime targets for the naval guns. And I can imagine whenever a naval round hit one of these things, uh, the, the concussion on the inside must have just been uh, just fearsome. Uh, and, and also, at the very least, would give you the headache of a lifetime. Okay, so here's the lower bunker at Wiederstand Nest 72. There is the upper bunker where we just were that held the 88. And this is the view that both of these bunkers would have had on D-Day.
one quick side note. A lot of people, whenever they come to Normandy, go to Aramanche to look at the remains of the Mulberry Harbor. And what they may not know is that there were actually two Mulberry Harbors. There was one here at Omaha Beach as well, but it was destroyed by a storm shortly after D-Day. And here is uh, one section of that Mulberry Harbor. Now, Saving Private Ryan is easily one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, and the opening scene is widely regarded as being one of the best depictions of what combat looked like here on Omaha Beach ever captured on film, which I agree with. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't some uh, historical inaccuracies with Saving Private Ryan. Some of them are little things that, that people like me nitpick. Uh, one of those is that Captain Miller is depicted as being with Company C of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. In the beginning of the movie, it says that they're landing on the Dog Green Sector. Well, in reality, Company C didn't land on Dog Green. They actually landed right here where I am right now, just to the west of Dog Green in the Charlie Sector. And the guys from Company C were going to be tasked with taking these daggum cliffs right here. And guarding this particular area were going to be Germans in Widerstand Nest 73. So this video is turning out to be a bit of a lie. I said I was going to show everything from the German perspective, but looks like it's going to be both perspectives. But can we just take a moment to stand here on this beach and appreciate how big of a job it was for those rangers in Company C to go up and take these cliffs. My gosh. Uh, now, Ranger Company C was tasked with landing here and then if, if you look out in the distance, a lot of people stand here at Omaha Beach and they think that is Point du Hawk. Uh, now, I'm going to get the pronunciation on this right, but I think it's Point de la Percy. Um, now, whenever the, the Rangers landed, of course, they sustained heavy, heavy casualties uh, on their landing. They ended up scaling these cliffs, and instead of going right and heading towards their objective, seeing the, the withering gunfire and the damage that the... Germans on uh, Widerstand Nest 73 were inflicting, they instead hooked left and started taking out these positions. All right, we're gonna go up there and take a little closer look now. We have moved up on top of the bluffs here. And if you've ever wondered what D-Day looked like from the German perspective. Well, here you go. So in the early mornings of June 6th, you can imagine looking out and seeing this fleet and maybe being a German machine gunner or a mortar man up here on this position, seeing hundreds of Americans turning into thousands of Americans storming the beaches right here uh, above what is the Charlie sector of Omaha Beach. Man, uh, this, this definitely gives you a, a different perspective of the battle. So once again, I just want us to take a moment to appreciate what the Allies had to overcome on D-Day. Because my goodness, just imagine being a German machine gunner up here on this sector of the beach and firing down on the Americans who are, are landing there at the water's edge. Uh, obviously, we have a very commanding view up here. Now, of course, there would have been naval gunfire uh, that the Germans are taking uh, and you know, seeing thousands upon thousands of men coming across the beach, uh, but dang, this definitely gives me a different perspective on the battle, seeing it from this position. 
Um, all right, now there are a, a few other positions here at WN73 that I want to show. All right, and real quick, just so that we have full context for what Viderstand Nest 73 would have looked like, these are the concrete bunkers that would have served as barracks for the Germans that were manning this particular strong point. So this is what Viderstand Nest 73 kind of looks like today. Um, it's a like an RV park or something like that, a place where people can you know have like a little tiny vacation home. Um, and right here we have uh, another set of the German barracks. So again, we're kind of in amongst this tiny house village. And uh, also here, as a part of WN73, would have been some of these mortar to brooks. So uh, right back there on the other side of like that tiny house, uh, you're starting to get to the edge of the cliff overlooking the ocean. So these mortars would have been, you know, set back this way a little bit to provide mortar fire onto the beach. Uh, so this would have been like an 80 millimeter mortar that would have been firing on Company C of the Rangers. All right here's another one of these 80 millimeter mortar to Brooks up here at WN73. And again, these are set back from the beach to provide mortar fire to the uh, Americans who were storming uh, the Charlie sector. All right, we're gonna wrap up WN73 with the casemate that held the big gun here. Uh, this would have held a 75 millimeter gun. And uh, if we move up here, we're gonna be looking right back in the sun, so it might get a little bleached out. But this is generally the view that the 75 millimeter would have had down the beach. You can see very commanding uh, view. This is Charlie sector on the left and dog green on the right and it's thought that this gun we don't know for sure we have to be kind of humble whenever we are approaching history because we don't know everything but it's thought that this is the gun that really did the devastation to company a of the 116th infantry regiment whenever they were the first ones to touch down here on omaha beach Well, those are a few of the German positions here on Omaha Beach. It's, it's good to come to places like this and look at the battles from, really, as an American, from the other perspective or, or from the other side and to kind of empathize with the enemy in a way. Uh, not to agree with what they stood for or what they fought for, but to gain a more full understanding of the history and a greater appreciation for what happened here. But yeah, tide is coming in just like it was on June 6th and we are off to the next place. If you watch and subscribe to this channel, then I have a feeling you are really going to love CuriosityStream. Uh, CuriosityStream is a subscription-based streaming service that, that really caters to people like us who, who love learning. They have thousands of different documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers. So right now, I'm in a big World War II phase, so I've been digging into a lot of their military history content. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of a show called D-Day, Wings of Victory, which has, has really, really been good. Uh, but aside from the military history content, there are tons of different varieties of content 
uh, on Curiosity Stream that would cover about anything that you would ever be interested in. So you can access Curiosity Stream on a variety of different platforms, including Roku, Xbox One, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and at under $20 a year, it is super affordable. So if you go to curiositystream.com forward slash history, uh, right now you can take advantage of a special offer where if you use the promo code history, you can get 25% off of a subscription to Curiosity Stream. That makes it out to like $14.99 a year, which is insanely affordable, way more than most other platforms out there. Uh, so anyway, this is something that, that I've really been consuming a lot of and have really been enjoying the content that CuriosityStream provides, and I think that you will as well.